Several knockout blows have been dealt this week. Find out who's on the receiving end on this week's episode of the Indie Bar Report Podcast. Hey, Rip, back again, episode 261. I'm Nick, I'm slowly dying. Ryan's going to really put the emphasis on host and co-host this week. So he's going to drive this ship because I think I may die halfway through this episode. Ryan, take it. I mean, I, I would really de-emphasize the slow part of slowly dying because you are, uh, it was like, yeah, sorry, I've been sick. And then now it's like, not going to make it. Yeah. And I, I'll give you the credit. I think you're more, I think you're legitimately sick and not just like man cold sick where it's like, I have a cold and men are dramatic about it. I'll give it to you. You seem pretty yeah. sick. I mean, could have just said you don't want to come to my party today. That's fine. But whatever. <laughs> Life. It's okay. I'm not going to think about it a lot. It's fine. Um, yeah. I'll just cut out a big chunk of my day from party planning to to do this pot on a Saturday, inconveniencing myself massively. Now, now I can't be doing a lot of the cleaning and the setting up things and uh, going out to the store. And, and now I have to sit here and talk about baseball while my wife does a lot of that. So I'm um, really taking one for the team here. Well, you're welcome for me being a small pox blanket. <laughs> I like the insinuation that you're being passed around to contaminate others. I'll dig into that another time, I'm sure. Oh, uh, man. Do you well, I could lit my ass here? for writing, and then I could actually be a small pox blanket if you prefer. Just show up, lick a doorknob, and walk away. Add a little chaos to this party. Literal party. Yeah, all right. Just start not? coughing on the food and everything and then leave. We won't be feeding people. Okay, and there'll be cake. That's about it. Anyway, man, we kind of had a bit of a week on the indie ball side of things. I'm sort of scrolling through my own notes over here. Uh, this is unfortunately now maybe we even get a free pass here, which I shouldn't mention this because we were kind of stumbling into a week, which is a little bit of a couple cliffhangers, like not really completed things going on because we had the ongoing Chicago dogs conversation, which is spoiler alert going to end in a, well, we'll continue to watch this play out. And then we had some drama going on with our new friends up in new England which is going to once again lead to a, we'll see how this plays out. So, um, you know, maybe it's good that we're not now going to just vamp for an hour and a half about a couple of stories that we don't have a conclusion on. It might've been a gift actually. Yeah, no, actually it's going to work out pretty well. I know on the dog's front, I do have a small update, which, uh, I wanted to go into more detail and stuff. I got tipped off and more like off the field, more front office type drama around Monday last week. and. Well, I got sick on Tuesday, so I really wasn't able to go too deep into it. Conspiracy theorists eat your heart out on that one, by the way. Yeah. It was great. The day after he found this, he was struck yeah. deathly ill by a mysterious illness. What what could we make of this? What did he know? Yeah. What did he find? What was he close to finding out? Hey, yeah. Oh, there was that. I'm so dumb. <laughs> yeah. No, honestly, though, like. <laughs> There it actually is some serious stuff from what I was hearing. So from what I was told, I want to make sure I'm actually in like a good, I guess, physical health and like able to think, which to be fair, even in the best of shape, that's a questionable proposition. But uh right now definitely would not be my best. So I'm putting a pin in that grenade until, you know. I could talk for more than 15 minutes without, you know, having my throat on fire. So that's what that they wanted from you. Yeah. That's what they, that's what they wanted is, Oh yeah. Just hold it off a little bit longer. I'm going to finish the job, dude. Hey, they're getting closer. That, that's the title where we're at. But yeah, no, you mentioned we have some stuff. So there is some decent stuff. So I guess we should probably pick one of them and start with it. Because once we're done with this, then I'm editing it and then I'm going back to sleep. Yeah, I mean, you if you would like, you can kind of prioritize how you want to go about things. Because if you want me to talk more about something, then you can be like, I'm taking a couple of minutes to take this topic. So I'll let you determine the order of topics here, bud. All right, I guess uh, I guess let's hit Chicago to start. Because I feel like we should probably, that's kind of the obvious follow-up point. Uh, we'll get to that, and then I guess we'll, we'll kind of swing down the list of priorities the rest of the way. Um, cool. Yeah, so I'll throw in my little bit of an update 
and then from there i'll uh i guess i'll toss it over to you and let you kind of take charge of the situation um so as far as chicago is concerned uh i got on the phone right before i got deathly ill on tuesday with a member of the front office chris juro uh to talk about some of the stuff we mentioned on last week's show you go back and listen to last week's show which i honestly would recommend over this um to get caught up on the situation but uh she had some notes and just some follow-ups she wanted to put in from the dog side of things so i guess i'll make that clear now all right so some of the notes uh she wanted to emphasize she said neither butch nor jd were fired specifically over text both (laughs) contracts uh expired and they had made these decisions over the phone she was in pretty constant contact with butch and uh as far as butch went there was conversation over text there was conversation by email this conversation over the phone uh and it she made it appear to be uh butch's decision to say he's just gonna hang him up i'm done i don't want to do it no more to which then she called him followed up and then that was a decision made there in the case of jd joe dominic uh the decision was made not to renew his contract and they didn't fire him they just let the contract expire at the end of september so uh they said he wasn't a cultural fit with the organization so make of that what you will um likewise uh we got a little bit more context around the altman trade which essentially was uh two things and again i hate mentioning players names because i know some guys reach out to me and were like hey can you like be careful about that and trust me we're always are careful about it but in this one particular instance i feel like i kind of have to name the player that we talked about because again i don't want like rampant speculation I mean, and, it's not like we talk to them like it doesn't yeah. mean anything about that it's just that i mean this yeah. is just the news story going on like it's sort of a public figure situation exactly it, that's kind of what it is and like i said again i understand like how it is from a player perspective but again like this is just exactly that was related to me i want to relay it to you guys so that way i don't you know have any sort of conflict about changing anything i just want to straight to and straight from so that way full transparency on it. uh supposedly from the dog's point of view uh altman was offered contract it was a it was a pretty solid contract from a financial situation one of the largest if not the largest docs had offered a player in the past and it had sat out there for some period of time and he was on the fence about accepting it admittedly he was in australia at this point so i imagine it was rather hard to have a constant back and forth with the time difference between chicago and i believe he was with melbourne i want to say i think so yeah so either way the australian to Chicago time difference is pretty huge, so it was hard to really sit down and work anything through. And after a certain period of time, Adelaide. Sorry, that's on uh, me. Should have known. I knew it in my head too, and I was like, I know the Adelaide team better, and I could see him in the jersey. That's on me. Oh, what a waste of watching a lot of Australian baseball this year. Yeah, <sighs> Ryan choked in the clutch. <sighs> Not the best work today from anybody. Uh, I'm but. also very sick, and that's why I made the mistake. <laughs> that work i think i sold that yeah good enough but in any case yeah so after about a, uh, a period of time of the contract being out there not hearing back they uh rescind the contract because of the amount of money that was on it supposedly it was causing too much hardship on the team to actually field the rest of the roster because of the size of it so they needed an answer and basically said you didn't get back to us we could give you a different contract or no contract and then they made the decision to trade them because, well, they just really wanted pitching was the answer I got. Mm-hmm. They really wanted to build up their pitching. They're familiar with Augie Voigt. They wanted Augie Voigt back. <clears throat> so they took an opportunity to get him because Lake Country was interested. Supposedly, it wasn't a thing that really came to fruition quickly. Uh, I have a fairly good authority. That's, uh, that's not the case. I have a fairly good authority that it did, in fact, come together pretty quickly, at least from uh, the non-Chicago end of things. So uh, make of all that what you will. That's from the dogs. Also, likewise, I should say that that Altman decision was uh, Trish took full responsibility 
responsibility for that, saying ownership was not at all involved in that. So make a take. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure that's falling on the sword. I'm not sure that's, you know, just being the good soldier. I'm not sure that's the truth. I don't know what it is. But make that what you will. Uh, Ryan, you take it from here. I'm going to go die in a corner. Yeah, man. I mean, as we're all called to do. Um, boy, there's a lot. Uh, it does feel, and we kind of said it last week, but it does more and more feel like interacting with the uh, former Gastonia front office from last year. Um, man, it's it's difficult because you do want to give some credence to things, but it's also when you have one source saying, no, this is what happened. Like, this is not what happened, drawing some lines. But then you have, I mean, at times more than half a dozen sources saying the other, it's difficult. And that doesn't necessarily mean that the majority is the correct opinion. I mean, and very often it's one person, I've seen it before, where there's an incorrect report coming from one person and they've gotten that report to six more people. And then those six people share it like it's fact because they trust them. So it, just because one person's saying something doesn't mean it's wrong if everyone else is saying something else, but it doesn't mean there should be further questions here. Uh, everything I've heard from, about Trish has been positive. Um, so I will there's say that. that. Yeah. yeah, which is interesting. There's a difference in the Gastonia one where the COO run the show was not, <laughs> not well reviewed. I'll tell you that. Um, so it's just a very interesting scenario there. And uh, we're going to continue having to look into it. Uh, the funny thing, and here's the thing that gets me, and, and I think this is worth noting. Some of you may already have seen this. Uh, a lot of people comment on it. saw that. Is that, and I'm, you know what? I'm going to do myself the favor of pulling this thing up here. We're going to keep talking so I don't have to edit it out. Um, we really weren't going to follow up on this too much, honestly. Um, this was going to be something that we looked at and, you know, we talked about and we're like, wow, that's weird. And then there was some more follow-up details. We we're like, wow, that's weird. But I don't think either of us were super eager to dig into the Chicago story because, you know, there's a lot of weird ownership groups around and who's to say how many people want to get involved in this and what it, people felt was worth discussing and, and whether people found this interesting and whether it was our thing to dig into. Honestly, I was hesitant on the Gatstonia thing to dig into it. So I, I'm not really, I don't want to be a front office reporter. That's not what I'm looking to do. I like on field. Now I, that was kind of how things were proceeding until what was it? Two days after the podcast came out yeah. and the American association posted a graphic saying the Chicago dogs named one of the, and then it's highlighted best places to work in sports by sports business journal with a little link to an article and a photo. Um, I, th- that's, that struck us as odd. Um, especially as even in the Instagram comments, multiple people were like, yeah, who'd you ask this from? Like it, there was a lot of people calling BS on it and it very much felt like a move. And the American association is one that we're very complimentary of. We like their work. We think they make good decisions. This felt like an Atlantic league move for lack of a better term. It felt like an owner group or an owner put pressure or maybe just the team put pressure on the league to share this and it's quite a coincidence this came out on march 4th it's very it's just very interesting um considering some of the stories we've heard from the front office uh from talking about places to work we're not just talking about frankly coaches and managers and players potentially having issues i've heard stories of directly uh their owner like shot hunter by the way yeah yeah Thank you. So, Mr. Hunter, I mean, directly being, I mean, I would say combative, if not pretty aggressively confrontational in a way that would be seen as unprofessional with employees in the front office, even interns doing so publicly um, and just not operating in a way that is seen as professional in a modern business setting or really any business setting in the industry or any industry. So, that's the kind, that's the picture I'm hearing. And that's why we kind of, side-eyed that post you look at all the comments including several that were from you know former team employees that identify themselves as such and we're just like no who'd you ask on this like this is absolutely not accurate that was enough to make us go okay what and kind of pique our interest because it did feel a bit pointed it felt weird that it happened maybe just coincidence but for it to come out right after a report one either felt pointed or two felt like 
frankly, maybe we look real dumb and we need to look more because maybe it is a great place to work. And we just said it maybe wasn't and it deserved to be looked at more. So that continued to get us asking some questions here and we will continue to do so until we get some more answers here because something smells. I'm a believer in when there's smoke, there's fire, uh, especially in Chicago. Is that terrible? That felt bad. Didn't like it. Uh, uh, damn. Didn't light any lanterns, and, so it's okay. Nice. But Fair. We'll say just as a follow up on that. <clears throat> I did ask Trish about that when we were having our conversation on Tuesday. <clears throat> about some of the accusations made by former employees of, oh, it's not a great work environment. That's one of the things I've, I've been working on or trying to work on, even with the flu, was following up on a lot of that with a lot of former interns and things like that, just to get a general sense of it. I mentioned, like, hey, I heard some very disturbing things about the going on at that front office, you know, the way that these people are treated. I, I kind of shared some of the preliminary findings on it. And uh, the best way I could describe the reaction was, full front of denial of any of that happening so i feel like it's important to get on there she mentioned that so i feel like i should mention it said and didn't hear about anything like what i had suggested ever happening in the front office which was a lot of just like you said very combative very aggressive behavior um i had people come into my dms using a different word that starts with a and ends with e um <laughs> to describe that behavior she also did mention one of the people that commented on that uh, sports business journal post and said i was really kind of surprised by it because this is a person that worked for the team in 2018 left in 2019 and then a couple of years later called back asking if you know she could have her job back so she was very surprised to ha- hear that now, I have no way of verifying that. I don't know which person that was. Uh, I obviously have to reach out to a lot of different people still. But um, I do want to just throw that in there just so that way we have their angle on it in there. That mm-hmm. being said, I will also say I had one or two people pop into the DM saying uh, they used to be you know, a corporate America type and that sports business journal is kind of one of the go-to uh, mm. press PR uh, yeah. spas where you call them up and say, hey, we need a good article posted about ourselves. And uh, they come in, they write the piece for you. Yeah. So, uh, I'm sure there's I definitely a bit of an got, exchange. Yeah. So it's yeah. one of those types of situations. And the docs have been listed in there before. So, mm-hmm. again, I don't know that for certain, but I did have people mentioning that. So that's something to watch as well. Yeah. Um, look, could be nothing, but again, it is an awful lot of people to come out of the woodwork about nothing. Uh, and also to the point, and I, and I thought this through at least the beginning of my Gastonia deep dive last year was, okay, even if it's nothing, isn't it, if it's nothing and this many people are coming out to, I guess, make up stuff or with only half an interpretation of something, still want to push it and verbalize it something is still going on. Like, why would that many people, because we've had things before. Uh, I'm trying to think off the top of my head. Southern Maryland jumps out where I've been a little critical and a lot of people come at me like, you don't know, like, it's fine. What are you talking about? Um, there's been a couple others here and there where like, there are, it's not like organizations are just sitting out there for former employees to jump them. I mean, I, even with Gastonia, I had a lot of people make sure they came out of the woodwork and defended multiple people to be like, yo, these people are not who the issue are. Make sure you don't have an issue like don't bring them up in that way unless you know like I, like i i won't that's cool appreciate that insight so it, again it's not i have i'm a little bit sore when it comes to the implication of these are you know scorned from employees or whatever and they shouldn't be listened to especially as somebody who myself reported on issues in lexington last year or i'm sorry two years ago and i early reported the sale of the team and then that was publicly denied and I was pointed to as a, a disgruntled former employee yeah. as a reporter on them not having money and all of that. And it then was proven correct on stuff. So I don't allow that to write off a story. There's something going on here and I think we're going to continue to dig in. Exactly. So 
That is a pretty good place to be at for right now. Pretty decent mm-hmm. update. I will say, because I there were a couple of players that got concerned when they popped into the DMs after the episode came out. And it does seem like a lot of people that are talking, they do seem to be very concerned about some sort of retribution coming back around on them. I will say that seems to be more than anywhere else a common theme. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure if you've seen that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I'll leave it like this. There's a reason we omit we omit details that can be used to identify any of the sources. So you guys are safe. You are going to be fine because we omit anything that can be used to track down the one specific person. It's all yeah. anonymous. It's either former player, former intern, former employee. So you guys are fine. We're not going to list you by name. That's not going to happen. Anything you say to us, if you don't want your name on it, it won't be there. You have to specifically say, put my name to it for us to put your name to it. We assume anonymity when talking to players. Exactly. Even now, like when we had to mention like the Altman trade right there was only what we gotten from Trish. That was it. The that only her part of it, and that's because she mentioned him by name. So <clears throat> I'll say that. We're from a player perspective, we're not gonna list any names, we're not gonna list any information. We understand you guys are in a very difficult spot because obviously you got a lot to lose, especially as a player in a part of baseball where it's almost a hundred percent connections on how you get your next job. I totally understand it and I totally get it being apprehensive i really do and that's why i really appreciate when it comes forward and wants to give information and try to lend a hand to the cause here so that way we can figure out what's going on one way or the other and obviously ideally we'd love to be wrong and find out that it's actually a great working environment and there's just been you know poor communication here and that's what the problem is but to this point it doesn't appear to be that way it appears to be at best a disconnect between what some members of the front office believe is reality and what the rest of the front office believes is reality and what the coaching staff and the players believe is reality. And that's the best case. Mm-hmm. Or at worst case, it's a genuinely uh, toxic working environment. So we're trying to get to the bottom of it. We're going to protect the sources to the best we can. And that's why we value the anonymity of every source. And we're not going to put you on record <clears throat> Unless you specifically request that your name be attached to it, so I just want yeah, that out. And there. that's and we've talked we point. talked recently about us. You know, we'll look for multiple sources on information to make sure it's accurate. But also, we look for multiple sources because we won't. I still will try not to report anything unless I have multiple sources giving it to me because that means it's public enough knowledge that boys are going to be hard to track anybody down and pinpoint the fact that they gave me something. Exactly. So, um, that's. I mean, that's pretty much the rule of thumb is if we're not hearing something from multiple people, it's not going out. Um, and look, if they do start trying to, you know, push back on people and try to sort of get some retribution, you know where to go. Let us know, man. We're happy to put down blast. We, I'll call it out. It happened last year with Gastonia. The guys were sitting there in that clubhouse and apparently from debatably what was said specifically or implied from Rick White himself they were going to be facing some issues getting signed in the league again if there was a problem. That's what was being, that is what was at least understood by the players, whether it was said expressly or not. And I brought that up and very quickly there was a, whoa, no, 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 there won't be any of that. There won't be any of that. It's like, all right. And, but from what I heard from players was that was not the tone before it was reported. So again, he, he, you know, remember here that there's a give and take. They don't have all the power here. Um, the American Association is a pretty image conscious league, not luckily for everybody in the way that the Atlantic League is, but they do have a good run going of positive <laughs> stories and positive vibes. And I, they seem like a league that's going to be pretty um, hesitant to continue to back a horse if it's uh, not only losing, but also kicking the jockey in the face. Yeah. I don't I think will... I horse racing. Uh, just a different type of horse racing. That's all. <laughs> But I will say also, I I will say Trish did seem sincere, and I did enjoy the conversation with her. I I will say the people that all said 
she's not part of the problem. I liked working with her. She's one of the people I had a good relationship with the front office. I can absolutely see that. I could definitely see that. So make of that what you will. Yeah. Uh, where to next, my guy? I guess we could talk about some other front office happenings. Let's go to New England, yeah. I guess. So Sure. And if you want to intro it, I mean, I've been digging into it a little bit. I don't know what you've heard, but you can hand off. Yeah, I'll, I'll just hit the intro real quick and then hand it to you. Do it, man. All right. So I'm not the only one that got hit with a knockout blow this week. Uh, <laughs> another Nick also got hit with a knockout blow, and that would be oh. Nick DeRossier, the GM of the New England Knockouts. He has been relieved of his duties with both the knockouts and Brockton Rock. He was the GM of both teams, ran both teams, and uh, we have yet to have a reason given for that. The only email address I could find for the knockouts, I emailed to request a comment from the team, have that heard back. If I do wind up hearing back, I'll let y'all know it's what I hear. But until then, no comment. We don't know why. We just got a social media post saying he was relieved to duties. Make of it what you will, Ryan. Go tell us what you found. So, it, sorry to say, it, I haven't found much yet. But basically, it's again one of the smoke. There's smoke, there's fire type of things. Um, first instinct was this is a very weird uh, news release. Let me pull it again so I have it in front of me. Uh, the it was on social media, which is usually a bold way to go about a front office change, even if it is somebody as you know prominent as the GM. Um, the Post read, a news release, New England Professional Baseball LLC President Scott Profrock announced that knockouts and rocks general manager Nick Desrosiers, damn, I'm going to butcher that every time, has been relieved of I his duties. I think it's duties. for what it's worth. Derosier, no, that makes sense. That's such a better read. Um, for media inquiries, please contact the knockouts front office, which seems we have, and we haven't heard anything back. Interesting. Now, um, why that is so strange is because how often, if it is posted that someone is leaving an organization, it's very often, thank you for your help, thank you for getting this off the ground, appreciate all the work you've done, yada, yada. It, it is so strange to say, specifically, they have been relieved of their duties. Continuing, yeah. like moving right on. That is like when you drive by a store or a restaurant or whatever, and they have a sign that says, under new management, it is one, letting you know, and two, kind of saying, last guy sucked, he's gone now, or giving the finger to the last guy. Like, yeah, it, there's no need to, or it's an advertised fact that's under new management, unless you think it's important to know. Uh, it was, so that was weird. That got me to go, okay, and it's, what, 10 weeks before your first season, you just rolled out the brand, now you're letting go of the GM of the team. That was enough to get me going, oh, what's going on in Brockton, friends? So I started going and hitting up everybody I could find in Brockton. Um, so if you have a cousin in Brockton, tell them to check his DMs. Might have something for me. But um, I still have some people to contact, and I still have some answers to get. I've been getting more questions than answers, if I'm honest with you. But I'll at least walk you through the questions that are hitting and the things that we're finding. Mm -hmm. uh, first thing is... Uh, yeah, everyone agrees it's really weird. Everyone agrees the communication in this front office seems to be dreadful. Um, they do seem to be pretty unprepared for the task they're taking on currently. And beyond that, they also seem to... This is not an organization with the most successful track record, it seems like. I mean, even Brockton being there a while is sort of a mixed bag, the Rocks team that has already preexisted. Um, that's the first part. The second part was this Nick uh, DeRosier guy, it might, sometimes you see somebody get let go randomly and you're like, that's a bad sign for this front office. I don't think it's that clear cut. I, this guy, and sorry to bring back the Gastonia drama from last year, but those familiar will remember the resume on him has given me Veronica Gion vibes. Um, very wishy-washy and weird. Managing General Partner and President at Liberty Sports Group, LLC. That is the group, I think, involved with the teams, I think. It's a little hard to track down exactly. Um, it, he's the chairman of Front Row Hospitality, which is basically a hospitality company that does food for seemingly whatever Liberty Sports Group is involved with. Current CEO of DCI Projects, which is like very little there. But he loves, and like an investor in like Orange County SC, which I'm not sure what that even means, essentially. So um, it, it's just one of those ones where every job and company is hard to pin down. Um, 
started as a boutique consultancy, has grown to unparalleled collective of industry titans, converging expertise to reimagine global engagement. Say what you do. Say what you do. Yeah. Okay. That's a lot of corporate um, speak right there. Yes, it is. That's a lot uh, of corporate our agility speak. honed over 16 years ensures personalized attention to your unique needs. To do what? Where they specialize in venue services, management, global partnerships, food service, and hospitality, which is weird because it's the same thing front row hospitality seems to do. So are you just front row hospitality? What is happening? Maybe I don't understand the business. Maybe I don't understand what's going on there. But it does feel like a guy who might be a lot more talk than he is capability. Um, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I get reached out to and say, nope, that wasn't how it is. Maybe he breaks down the door of my house and kills me in my sleep. You know, there's a lot of options from here. However, it did definitely strike a chord that something is going on. And I am tempted to believe it's both. I think this was the wrong person in charge. And I'm thinking this organization might be a garbage fire. Um, the communication seems to be strongly lacking. I've talked to a few people around that front office, none of whom have had really any clue what's going on. No real insight into the long-term plan. It just has been very, as we kind of saw even with the logo pick, where when they picked the brand, the original brand, the Chowd Heads, we were the ones first and foremost to be like, beforehand even, before they announced it, we were like, can't do Chowd Heads, it's going to be a branding issue with the other team called the New England Chowd Heads. And then next thing you know, they go with it, and then they have to walk it back for whatever reason they spun. It just doesn't seem like a forward-thinking crew. And this has been kind of a garbage fire. Maybe this is just sort of, maybe there was something that was like the last straw, and now he's gone. Um, it's going to be interesting to see where they go from here because there's been a lot of red flags. I was just saying last week that I feel like, okay, we might be heading in the right direction here. That's so good to see. I really feel much better about the direction of this team after the new brand reveal. Like it seemed organized and seemed smart and uh, let's see where they go now. They've, they bought me, they bought some, some goodwill with me and some trust. And then immediately dude yeah, went sideways. Right. I was like, oh my God, man. Uh, it, it's brutal. Yeah, it's um, like it's like that old counter of how many days since a workplace accident, and now we got to reset it back to zero. It, yeah, good. Yeah, that's perfect. Yes, that's exactly it. And it's like, man, we worked so hard to get that little bit of progress, and now it's a disaster again. It's like, or it feels like a disaster again. It doesn't need to be, but yeah. yeah. Um, that's that's really it. There's nothing more yeah. there other than I'm talking about it and I'm going to continue to dig in and we'll see what we have next week maybe, but it's just really odd. That's all. Yeah. I mean, the whole thing, I definitely agree with that. I definitely got some people saying, you know, this just isn't well ran. <clears throat> One of the other things that was interesting was if you go to teamwork, take a look at some of their open positions. It's a lot. I, and if any bad communication talk, I'm kind of like, well, yeah, how could you communicate with that many open positions? Yeah. And there's some interesting ones too that are open. I will say that. There's like a long form documentary intern. And I'm just like, what the what what's that? Mm. Like there's a bunch yeah. that are just different. Yeah. I mean you have obviously now a general manager, an office manager, a street team ambassador, mascot performer, business and community service sales exec, uh, another mascot performer. General intern, ticket sale intern, stadium op intern, video production intern, promotion fan engagement intern, marketing content intern, long form documentary intern, scoreboard operator, uh, statistician, corporate partner exec, and clubhouse manager. I mean, I understand it's going to be a lot of openings and everything, but like, we're not more than two months away from opening day. You shouldn't have this many open positions. It's a problem. Yeah. Now, I've said in the past, and I will reiterate now when it comes to Scott Profrock, who was the president named in that little mini news release there. Um, while I have heard from the friends that I have from living in the area of the Phillies and people who know the front office and work in the front office, generally good things about working with Scott Profrock, I'll yeah. admit that a lot of them center on the experience of working with Scott, not the, um, let me find the word, not the success rate of working with Scott. And, and I'll explain that as, you know, he's not in a baseball job right now, really. He's more on the business side of running that. But uh, I think I pointed out when he was first announced that the issue that I've always kind of seen with 
Profrock is he was with the Braves in the early 90s, kind of left, honestly, right before their hot streak started. Went to Tampa uh, when he was with Tampa in baseball admin and as an assistant GM. He was gone in 2005, which some may remember was right before Tampa started getting good. Like that was where they bottomed out. Then he was with uh, Baltimore as assistant GM. Then he was a baseball ops director. He left, he was, he left, let go, whatever it was in 2008. 2008 was the bottom of their sort of sucking curve. Uh, literally the bottom of it. Uh, they, they were the worst record in 2009. And then they started getting good and they made that playoff run in 2012 and then won the division 2014 and got good. Mm-hmm. He went to the Phillies, keeping in mind it's 2008 directly after the World Series. The Phillies had maybe one of the worst series of general manager and baseball operations decisions over the years following the 2008 World Series. Basically a textbook example of how not to handle a World Series winning roster. And then he was basically an assistant GM through there interim GM into 2015 um, when they got rid of Amaro, if I recall. And then they s- continued to be bad into 2001, 2021 rather. He was, I believe, let go in 2021. And you might recall 2021 is right where the Phillies turnaround started. So he tends to be the guy who gets let go before a turnaround, which is not the guy you want to be. All that to say, that isn't really the role he has right now. Uh, I'm giving him every chance. I hear good things about working with him, but it is something to keep in mind. The success rate is a concern. Not to be harsh, again, because it does seem like a guy who's likable. So I'm like, well, (laughs) I don't know. Uh, But boy, it it is, if you're really in on the baseball operations thing and you're a nerd like me who's tracking who the assistant GMs are at teams, Scott Profrock has a bit of a, a reputation on that front. Yeah. It sounds like we just got to go run this team in New England. I think that's the winning answer. I'll be there. I'll even put pants on for this occasion. Hey, put it in for the uh, the opening on uh, teamwork. God, we'll see about it. Um, the interesting thing was I didn't see baseball operations listed, right? Do they have somebody doing that right now? Sorry, if I, that's, that's putting it on you like you would know. I was just saying I yeah, tried I, baseball ops in the major league level. Um, yeah, no, I, I didn't see anything like that. I didn't see. Yeah, yeah I, I, I believe they have. I believe that's being hand. I think they have. Oh shoot! I'm gonna draw a blank on his name. Their their manager up there. Sorry, he's newer, so I'm not as familiar with names on that. Uh, Jared um, Edmondson. Thank you. Yes, I believe he's also doing baseball operations. So that's a lot that also is a concern. Guy. That's a lot for a first time guy. <laughs> exactly. So maybe I would think about that but who knows maybe Profrock has his hands in that but is that a good thing we don't know so look for a lot of i've always said before um the phillies have a reputation for not having guys pan out in the minors getting rid of them and then they show out in indie ball for like a number of years um so look for that to be a, a possibility um because there could be a bunch of them showing up and uh, would not be very surprised with that. I believe Todd Van Steensel is one of them. So there you go. Hmm. There's that? there's a, a number of them, I'll tell you. Barnstormers usually have a couple. Yep. You're right. <clears throat> Let's keep moving before I drop that. Uh, yes, sir. Lake Erie has new ownership. It's going to be an investor group. It's led by the former Cleveland Cavaliers CEO, Leo Komorowski. He now owns the team. There's five other investors in the group. They purchased the club from the Cromick family. Cromick owned it for just about a decade. I believe they bought it in 2015. So, yeah, that's really what there is to it. Um, yeah, I'll let you take lead on it because, uh, well, obviously, I don't. <laughs> I don't have that. Uh, this arm's reaching the end of the line. It's got like. 95 pitches on it. We don't got much more left. Burn it. Go, yeah. uh, Reggie. Reggie on that one. I was, um, go, I was about to say, uh, <laughs> we're, we're Reggie hey, Harris territory. I let Reggie Harris slide in the Lake Country interviews. So I, I got to get that one. All right. Um, I don't have a ton on this right now. Uh, I haven't gotten a chance to really deep dive it. Um, the things that stuck out to me are he is a local guy, which is not what you expect the, the dude, the, the main guy there. And I'll pull the name back up, but um, he's, 
uh, Len Komarowski. He is the guy that he's local, uh, you know, Western PA, Eastern Ohio, basically his entire life and career, it seems. So that's a good thing. People from that area are well acquainted with the fact that Western PA, Eastern Ohio is a very particular, like, you know, pit Karen up through Pittsburgh, through the Subinville area, of, all the way up to Erie and Cleveland. It's a very, like, you know, blue collar, hardworking vibe. A lot of tough times across that area. A lot of sort of efforts to to rebuild and and resurge and sort of put you know a different type of industry through that area and, and help those people out. So he's been operating in those markets for a long time. He probably has a good understanding of it, which is great. Um, I think that Crushers, uh, the Lake Erie and the area that the crushers are operating in it would be a very tough one for someone who doesn't understand that area and feel comfortable so i'm glad that he's sort of being um pointed to as as the main guy running the show uh from that ownership group perspective and that's kind of what i've got there i don't have a lot on that group in themselves the bigger trend to watch is i am we are in the process of starting to feel out what it looks like when there's an ownership group taking over an indie ball team it's Indie ball has very much been an owner or a family of owners has the team and they're the team. They own the team and they're, it's a passion project and maybe it's a moneymaker, but usually it's because they love the team and the community and that's their baseball fans, whatever. Now we're starting to transition into ownership, like conglomerates for lack of a better term, but basically groups uh, of like investors in it. And, and we're starting to see that pop up here and there a little bit. Uh, we saw it in Gastonia. We saw it with, who is the other one I'm trying to remember might not be able to come up with it. Lexington. Um, that's very interesting to watch. We don't know what that's going to be. Anyone who follows me on social media might be aware. I am extremely on it. Cause it's been going longer on the minor league baseball side when it comes to uh, groups like diamond baseball holdings, taking over multiple minor league teams. It is something that is not good for the game. Diamond Baseball Holdings is not your friend if you're listening in an area with them, which I'm sure you are. Uh, I would, what we have seen from them is a willingness to cut towns loose, a, a lack of connection to anything but a profit line. Basically, they're running 30 plus minor league teams, looking at them as balance spreadsheet lines. And it comes down to the pluses and minuses on that. It, be wary if, if they buy up your local team or whatever. They, they're willing to spend money to get these things. It's extremely hard to win against them in a bidding war. You essentially need whoever's selling the team to want to not go with them. And even if it means less money, that's that's kind of what you, you need if you're going against on baseball holdings and something. There's other ones too. Um, uh, to, I forget who it is. Whoever owns Wilmington at this point, I forget their name, but um, they are also one, but they're a smaller group. Main Street Baseball, I think they have four or five teams. But that's becoming a larger thing. Less and less independent owned teams. I think it's about 50% of minor league baseball right now is owned by what is essentially an investor group. So all that to say, I am not sure Indie Ball is the model for that to continue. I'm not sure that Indie Ball is the model for that to succeed. And maybe that isn't what this is. Maybe this is just a group who wants to own a baseball team, which I would love to see. It was a little more of the vibe I got from Lexington, if I'm being honest. And maybe even Gastonia, but Gastonia is, they own a bunch of other teams for profit too. So watch it. But that is what we want to watch. That's what we're going to keep an eye on. It's going to be a wait and see. Will this become a trend? Will this be a team that's run as a line on a spreadsheet or as a group of individuals in a community? I'm encouraged by the fact that it's a local guy involved, but it is worth watching. Um, the last thought too on that is you need to, I don't even know how to phrase it. It's mainly just, it's an accountability thing. We need to keep it on ours. We're seeing it in one shot from talking about Dime Baseball Holdings to talking about a potential owner situation, whether it's Gastonia or Chicago, that's a little sketchy, or Lexington, huh? where there's pros and cons to individuals and to groups. The the investor group model tends to have better financial stability, but it can have a lack of personal touch, which causes an issue. Joliet, that was the other one. That's yeah. an ownership group technically now. But they don't have a bunch of. They do have a few teams, right? So yeah, yeah we're starting to see more and more. We're starting to see more and more. Yeah, it's yeah. happening. It's happening. We picked a good time to get the uh, Lake Erie the pod, didn't we? Yeah. Hey, yeah, Nathaniel team. Asher. Asher. He's on the show next week, so y'all can something to look oh, yeah. forward to. Perfect. Nicely done. I know. I even sickly, I'm able to get the uh, the plugs in there. 
but yeah no i i agree the investor groups are interesting it's something to watch out for and i do agree the low at least this one's led by locals so that's what you know gives me more confidence in this one right they actually presumably have some sort of stake in this to where they'd want to succeed for the community and being that their other businesses are intertwined in that general region it gives them a boost to do better as well as uh gives them more of an incentive to try to do more right and you know we'll see there is nothing we can do but wait and see man uh, so hopefully it's a it's a good thing. I understand why leagues like that again with the financial stab- stability thing, but I don't know. It's a big investment, and without the promise, the other thing crossed my mind is I wonder who is. Hold on, let me see. I'm gonna do a little research real quick. Um, oh, it's the Guardians now. Yada yada. Uh, I always forget that Lynchburg Hillcats. That's the one I'm looking at. Lynchburg is an extremely random place for my league baseball team to be um if i recall bank of the james stadium is very old very out of date and maybe i'm out of the loop are they going i feel like i haven't seen anything about them leaving lynchburg but i wonder if this group who probably has connections to cleveland sports teams further than just the cavaliers former ceo i wonder if this is an angle to try to get the crushers as the new single a team for cleveland in the near future because Lynchburg is a weird place to every single A team when every other team in the Cleveland fold is in Columbus, Ohio, Akron, Ohio, and East Lake, Ohio. And then it's Lynchburg, Virginia, an old stadium, which was not in good shape when I saw it uh, about a decade ago. So that's an interesting one. I, it's on the watch. That's one that I want to go down the rabbit hole on, but I can't right now. So this Understood. is pure hitting the grenade territory. We'll see. We'll, we'll, we'll maybe take a look down the road there. It's something to watch. Because the real money is in the development deals, the the money to be the minor league team for yeah. an LB team, because that gives you money. It brings you some business. And it also takes the uh, player salary, baseball operations, you know, yeah. expenditure basically off the books. So that's why it, it is a theory. Here, Rem. Uh,. I'm amazed we nearly got an hour out of this, frankly. So, uh, only thing I really think I got left to throw in, different, I know this is a hard transition, but uh, <laughs> even still, Quebec officially uh, list out their whole All Star game plan. Links in the show notes. You guys could check it out if you're interested in it. Uh, home Run Derby and Skills Comp tickets are $5. And, uh, all circuit tickets are fifteen, so that place is going to be rocking. That's about all I got on that. Yeah, man, that should be fun. That that's one environment that I've talked before about how hard it is to get a good All Star game environment, but that's one I'm pretty confident it's going to be good. Yeah, Quebec's one of my bucket list trips. I want to do that. Mm-hmm. I want to do yeah. that because it's just so that environment's going to be so great. But mm-hmm. I'm pretty hyped about it. Yeah, you got anything else you want to bring to the table before we wrap it, or? Uh, I got a random one. Um, okay. It's just going to be a Wait. quick one. I won't go deep dive on it because something I've been working on, uh, and I, I actually had it pretty much done for the Atlantic League, and then I, I shifted it once I started covering indie ball in the middle of everything, but was uh, working on an, an all-time sort of ranking of every indie ball team, like in the modern era, so talking like 90s on. And uh, I'm done putting together my list of the Atlantic League teams. And, and basically, I might fine-tune it a little bit more, but it generally... Uh, my t- I'll go. There's been 200 Atlantic League teams. That's why I was curious. So I like having all 200 in the ranking. So uh, I will say, I'll give you a couple where you can do a one word answer. So it's not too heavy on you. I'll just do a couple trivia questions. Um, all right. Of the bottom 10 out of the 200 Atlantic League teams, how many of them do you think were travel teams? Eight. Six. Though three of them were the Camden River Sharks. So that's a tough scene. 2013, 2014, and 2015 Camden was Pepper a tough scene. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, that, we did not take care of that team. Um, that's on us. The, all right, two teams have, oh no, that's a, that's a tough one. I was going to say two teams made it to the top 10 teams of all time in their first season. However, I just realized, nope, they were both in 1998. So everyone was a new team. So it doesn't count. Um, 
let's go. What organization do you think is most likely to have the top team ever? Active or defunct? It is an active team. Ducks. Ooh, the Ducks' best team is number four, the 2009 squad. Um, though, I will say, let me see, what was that record? That was a, that was a good team, 78 and 47. Yeah. Um, God, that was a good team, actually, yeah. Um, Lou Ford is prime at that point, by the way. Doing 72 yeah. games, of a 937. Oh, dude, he was 34 at the time. That's so funny. Um, 14 years ago. Uh, I got 2012's Lancaster Barnes Boomers ranked as my number one team. That was huh? a that was a good team, man. They had some gross players on that thing. They went 88 and 52, and it was a strong league that year. They had guys like um, Blake Galen was already there, but then he got boy, Blake Galen's been there forever too. You, you yeah. sleep on that, but they got um, Jesus Marchand, Ryan Harvey, Cody Kirkland, like guys who were just like Jamie Pedroja, like some dogs, but then the pitching staff was nasty too. And this is in the weeds. I mean, this is if you got real good, like mid 2010s uh, knowledge. Got Ross Peoples chucking, by the way. So how about that one for some crossover? Uh, some Horacio, real sick Horacio stuff, Ramirez. Yeah. yeah. So there were some some wild names in there. Dwayne Pollock. Um, but yeah, I was surprised to see a couple things. Number two all time in the rankings, I landed with the 2022 Gastonia Honey Hunters. Oh, wow. And then number eight, Eight all time, the 2023 High Point Rockers, which we were just talking about how good they okay. were despite not making it uh, to the championship again. But that sort of backs it up. A sandwich between them and the 2003 Cameron River Sharks. What a shame how hard they fell off. But yeah. that was fun. At some point, I'm either going to find a way to like do a full countdown on that one. Uh, multiple people have asked me about it. So I started doing the countdown. And as I said, I knew I was going to start covering all of any ball. So I hit pause on it. But yeah, man, it's been. Um, a bit of a journey trying to track all this information down and compare some real minute rosters. Yeah. Oh man, there were some ones. Who's the number 130 team? Who's 131? It's going to come down to their middle relief. Good Lord. Just yeah. push me off a cliff, big dog. Why am I like this? This is what I do for fun. You know, I could explain it, but right now I, I physically can't. So <laughs> it would take far too many words for what you're currently capable of doing. Exactly. I'm I'm at my Reggie Harris era right now. Oh yeah, man. He is strung out. Boy, you played easily era. What a tough year that was. <laughs> Never forget. Yeah. Oh man. Well, I'll you wanna sign this thing off? I'll, yeah. I'll let you get back to sleep. That sounds I'll, like a lovely yeah. idea. <laughs> so yeah. Uh Indie Ball Nation, all things Indie Ball Pod, Twitter, Indie Ball Report, whatever else. Thanks for hanging in there with us this one. Uh, next week will be better. Also appreciate you guys giving us our best episode last week in the Podbean era. Appreciate that. Wow. Yeah. yeah, okay. And we follow up with this. Exactly. That's why <laughs> I was so really excited to kill them. Exactly. Yeah, I, I just couldn't handle that kind of success. There's too much winning. I can't handle it. Um, but yeah, appreciate that from y'all. Hang in there with us this week. Next week will be better. We'll have an interview. And either Ryan will do it by himself because I'll be dead or I'll be healthy and good. We don't know, but we're going to find out. And that's the fun part about this show. So until next time, if there's a next time, don't forget to play ball. <laughs>